very important for us. This hospital garden, as part of contribution to a resilient food system, to encourage community visits that help assimilations of prehabilitants, and the most importantly is lessening the stigma of the mental health. So this is the picture tackling limited resources. See, this is all of these activities uh, engaging rehabilitants, so activities in the psychosocial rehabilitation unit, uh, making apron, uh, sewing masks when we are limited <laughs> of masks during this COVID, and also, um, oh, this is the moving bundle, then we will use this for selling the food products. And then when we need some wash, uh, washing points, okay, we upcycle wash machine, we designing upcycle aerosol um, box. And also for our current condition in um, this cafe, we are frankly speaking, this is still uh, closed for the time being due to the pandemic, that we have so many inspiration from previous speakers that we also have the plan, actually, that we need some spot to sell raw vegetables products, and also we will enrich our menu with all more vegan products. And this is the last. Our yell is like RSJ Bruba. It means mental hospital is changing. Rehabilitant productive. Uh, petani sejahtera, farmer is wealthy. So the point is this dimension is the encompass not only uh, doing our activities in the therapy of our patient or occupational treatment, but also we engage the community as a whole because this will be a good consequences for the uh, socioeconomic for us and also for our community. And then the last, we have our mascot. This one, we call it Mang Jihad. That's actually the acronym of Salam Semangat Jiwa Sehat. Keep the mental spirit healthy. Hatur Nuhun, terima kasih, and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Farihatini for sharing with us your initiatives. I love the concept that you are changing the way that uh, mental health should be seen and mental hospitals uh, particularly should be seen and how you have partnered with uh, local farmer groups. That is wonderful because like what Ms. Claire mentioned a while ago, they are the ones feeding us all. So everyone, let us not forget that. Let's keep our mental health Healthy. Okay. Let's now go to another presenter, Ms. Tasha Clinton, previously serving as the National Director for the Healthcare Without Harms Healthy Food in Healthcare Program. She guided a national staff of experts and network of partners to transform the role of food in healthcare accelerating uptake. To procure, of procurement, practice, and policy transitions to unenvironmental nutrition approach within the health sector. Prior to working with the organization, she led the management of hospital food service and clinical nutrition programs in both small and large scale healthcare facilities. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Tasha Clinton. Thank you so much. It's Great to be here um, with everyone, and particularly with our Healthcare Without Harm colleagues in Southeast Asia. Um, calling from early morning over here in the United States, but happy to be here. Um, so just quickly, a little bit about Healthcare Without Harm in the US. Um, we're part of the GGHH network, and our network includes a diverse set of partners. That includes uh, about 1,100 membership hospitals that are part of our, our organization in the U.S. called Practice Green Health. Let's see. We really see a transformative opportunity for healthcare that starts with the sector first addressing its own negative impacts on environmental health, climate change, and public health. 
to their purchases and operations. Um, and we, you know, have heard from speakers already today that this can be significant and there's a tremendous opportunity to address the use of toxic chemicals, the amount of waste hospitals use and contribute to their communities. Um, there's also the opportunity to look outside the hospital walls and partner with community through social, economic, and ecological strategies that build health, wealth, and resilience at the individual community and global scales. And ultimately, we're working towards a broader social transformation where healthcare leaders can advocate for policies that are more protective of both human health and ecosystems that sustain us. It really is a reinforcing cycle that aims to support healthy people living in equitable and resilient communities on a thriving planet. So it's important for me to note that uh, the presence of food insecurity and health disparities in the U.S. even prior to COVID-19, we had over 37 million Americans classified as food insecure last year, um, but that distribution wasn't equal. 25% uh, of African American households in the U.S. were food insecure compared to only 11% of white households. Race and poverty uh, at, alongside food insecurity correlate with obesity and diet-related diseases for a multitude of reasons that I won't get into today, but it's safe to say that even before COVID-19, there were unmitigated health issues that needed immediate attention. With COVID-19, the gap of impact on African-American and other people of color compared to white Americans was stark. It prompted important questions about how equitable is the U.S. healthcare system and support services like food access and economic opportunity. Infection rates were three times higher and mortality was six times higher in predominantly black communities. There is a strong movement within the U.S. to look at the systemic drivers of poor health, um, so beyond just the existence of disease, which we call addressing social determinants of health. This includes factors like homelessness, access to good jobs, um, poverty rates, and even um, the factor of race on health. Unfortunately, many of these efforts are often separate from efforts to ex in explore environmental health strategies and interventions of the physical environment, like exposure to smoke or other air pollutants. So COVID-19 really laid bare this uh, lack of connectedness between strategies and the importance of the critical intersection between social determinants of health and environmental determinants of health, as we saw higher rates of health disparities, impacted by those with poor air quality, reduced access to food outlets as restaurants and other public food venues closed. We also saw job loss and economic instability, which then of course increased food insecurity. And our emergency food systems were really overwhelmed. Um, they had increased need, but they had the inability to accept food items that were available in abundance in many cases out of fear of contamination, um, this had a ripple effect impacting food producers who had food that had nowhere to go, um, which really depressed the farm and food business sector. Um, there was also an increase in the delivery of, of uh, food uh, emergency systems because of homebound el elderly individuals or those that were higher risk for COVID complications. However, there were some fascinating bright spots as hospitals and communities worked to address the essential needs that their communities were calling for. Um, hospitals recognized their role as major employers and they created care kits and provided grocery kit gift cards to try and support their staff. Um, hospitals that traditionally hosted emergency food banks shifted to provide pickup at curbside for ease of access. Uh, having to close their cafeteria to visitors, some hospitals turned their cafeteria into food markets for staff alone who were struggling to get to the grocery store or they wanted to decrease their exposures. Um, and some hospitals recognize that their hospital kitchen may be one of the only operating commercial kitchens, considering that restaurants and schools were now closed. Um, some increased the production of food to provide meals to staff or even to donate to emergency food sites in need. 
And I really want to highlight one of these examples in more detail. Um, our U.S. healthcare team had been uh, leading a pilot project that involved 12 hospitals in California to track and save their food waste to then donate it to edible, the edible food portions to those who are hungry. This both reduced the climate and environmental impacts of food waste and addressed the need um, of, to, to address food insecurity. Um, so we did this by identifying a logistics company called Copia, which instituted an application hospitals put on their computer and their phones to schedule food donations. Um, the, the company would then identify emergency food nonprofit sites in need and deliver the food from hospitals to the community food sites. These sites ranged from senior care centers to churches, shelters, and food banks. And this is a snapshot of what the hospital sees when tracking their food. So in the early months of just piloting this initiative, this 12 hospital system donated over 38,000 pounds of food in the very first few months. This fo food would have gone to a landfill otherwise. And here is a link to the case study that lays out this initiative in particular, but I wanted to call this out because this became critical when COVID-19 hit. The 12 hospitals already participating in the pilot had the opportunity to increase their food production to donate even more food during this time because these hospitals had already set in motion a strategy that extended the reach of their food service operations outside the hospital walls. They were in an excellent position to support their community in this time of need. We, Healthcare Without Harm also worked with Copia to rapidly expand the reach uh, of their, um, their system to other hospitals throughout the country who are interested in initiating this food waste recovery and donation initiative. The same can be said for hospitals working with us to diversify their supply chain and to source some of their food from smaller local and sustainable farm and food businesses. It was these institutions that now had a diversified supply chain that gave hospitals access to more food vendors to work with in the, in, um, the case supplies were challenged. It also created an avenue for hospitals to increase their sourcing from these suppliers and put money into the pockets of farmers and food producers that were based in their community. These farmers were probably likely feeling a financial hit with other clients like restaurants or grocery stores or other places closing. So the high level takeaway for us in the US is that hospitals that recognize the need prior to COVID to step outside their walls to ensure the community health was better off in the midst of disaster, fared better during COVID-19 and are likely to fare better during future widespread disasters like climate change. So with that, I will pass it over to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have heard a lot of initiatives and I'm so happy that um, really this thing that we have in our country, in our world today, the insecurity for food is something that is, that is not for granted. I'm just so happy to listen to all of these initiatives that you have, uh, you are presenting and you have presented all of you. And I especially like the idea that you partnered with a uh, study to facilitate food donations. Um, I'm inspired and I will see if this can be copied here in the Philippines, especially here in our institution, so that we can also reduce food waste. Thank you so much, Ms. Tasha Clinton. And now, I would like to call on Yubel, Yubel Putra, Climate and Clean Energy Campaign Associate of Gaia Asia Pacific to input on the importance of eliminating single-use plastics in food systems in the hospital as a climate response. Yubel is the Climate and Clean Energy Campaign Associate for Gaia Asia Pacific. His interest in waste issues started from learning the history of a catastrophic landfill avalanche in his hometown, Bandung, Indonesia. Before joining Gaia, Yubel worked for two years as zero waste policy 
uh, advocacy staff at YPDB Bandung, a local NGO which implemented a Zero Waste Cities program since 2013. Wow! He was also involved in Alliance Zero Waste Indonesia Works. Yubel graduated from Institute Technology Bandung with a degree in environmental engineering. Take us away, Yubel Putra. Thanks, Miss Lady. So um, I'm only half three slides, but I'm going to tell you a story. But first, I'm going to introduce Gaia. So Gaia is a global network of 800 member organizations and individual across the region. Um, and I'm representing the Asia Pacific region. Last year, Gaia upstream Zero Waste Europe launched the Unwrap project to expose the impact of chemicals in food packaging. So there is a, this scientific consensus statement signed by 33 world pre-owned pre scientists warning that chemicals used in single-use plastic and food packaging represents a significant threat to human and planetary health, particularly the health of children. So what's the problem with single-use plastic or SUP? First, it's the largest industrial sector for plastic. So from all types of um, sector for plastic production, most of it goes for packaging. Almost 36% is produced as plastic packaging and mostly it goes for food. Even the building and construction sector has only 16% shares in 2015. So that's a huge number. But the issue is that uh, there's a myth that plastic can be recycled. No, it's not true. Not all plastic can be recycled. Even it, if it is technically can be recycled, it doesn't really mean it gets recycled in the system. So um, only 9% of those plastic produced uh, from the early production till 2015 get recycled. So you can get the image of how hard recycling is trying to get us out of this problem. But to raise this number is very challenging, especially in developing countries where cities are lacking basic waste management system, especially at store segregation and also segregated collection. Those, there are some efforts from industry to promote um, technological fix like chemical recycling or incinerator. For, but for chemical recycling, uh, the industry promoted as a way to re improve recycling rates, especially, especially for the low value plastic. But this is actually a distraction, not a seal for a bullet to solve plastic recycling issue, especially when it converts the plastic into fuel. So this really hinders our efforts towards a climate resilient efforts as a global community. Um, and if it's not recycled, it might get burned or incinerated, which create these toxic cocktails that can be leaked to our air, our water bodies, which we cannot really govern. You cannot tell which pollutants come from where when it gets emitted to the environment. So burning waste, especially plastic, release the gas, ash, and microparticulates or even nanoparticulates that contains these small um, chem uh, ultrafine chemicals, the porphyrin chemicals. This disrupts our body and immune system. The other thing is, if it's not burned, it gets leaked to the environment, or if you're lucky, it gets into the landfill, which is also uh, mostly poorly managed, and it can change into microplastic. Next. So you can see the problem is that plastic production, um, next slide, please. So the uh, plastic production is expected to quadruple uh, by 2050, and the oil industry is dying. What that means? So there is no off taker for oil company. They need a market, which is plastic. So this will be a growing target for the industry to produce even more plastic. And um, by 2050, the plastic share of global oil consumption will be at least 20%. So that's a huge number that will contribute to our climate and eventually damage our health and you know, a human being uh, in the world. So plastic also contains a lot of chemicals which is harmful to our health. Thousands of chemicals are intentionally used in plastic packaging, and we don't know it. Among those chemicals are like BPA, PFAS, phthalates, flame retardants, which has this property of endocrine disruptor chemicals. 
then it, it has been proven hazardous for human health. Exposure may lead to cancer, heart disease, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, genetic toxicity, chronic disease, and a lot of uh, diseases may lead to autoimmune diseases. So over uh, 1,200 studies show that this chemical migrate from packaging into food and beverages, and many of these chemicals are never tested on human health. And for most of these chemicals, the presence is undisclosed. You don't know what's in it. So if you see plastic packaging, you never know unless those seven um, symbols of plastic recycling, and it doesn't really show those thousands chemical in it. So the solution is, next slide please, is to eat fresh and local food. This has been presented gratefully with other, other presenter. Plastic are used for long hauling processes to reach out far, far away consumers. But if we shift to a local short food supply chain, this might empower local economics. The farmers also combining with short supply chain, it means we can combine and couple it with the decentralized organic management like composting, and that means we can bring back those, those precious nutrients back to our soil, not to the landfill. That's important. And go for reusable because plastic is promoted as a safe option to pro prolong our food shelf life. Well, yes, it prevents biological and physical degradation, but not mentioning that there is chemical leakage in this product. So close to 200 organizations sign the call to action to make demand regulator and industry to first ensure full disclosure of information, second, restrict the use of hazardous chemicals in food packaging, and the last one is to adopt policies. I believe hospital has significant um, you know, role in this part that support the transition toward safe, reusable, and available packaging. And two months ago, 100 scientists published a science statement that states that reusable containers are safe during COVID-19. Hand washing and soap washing is effective to kill the virus, so there is no need to fear about going reusable. And the other, the last thing is to complete have this, you know, a complete information disclosure. So if we are presenting um, food package in plastic, we must check what plastic type is used. Is it safe? Is it not? Or if it's not, please don't use it because it um, harm the health of our generation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hubel, for that short, sweet, but very uh, comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. I am ever more convinced that really plant-based diet is uh, very important. And we should push this because this is going to help in protecting the planet. Thank you so much. And also, I am... I am now having an audit in my mind. What are the single plastics that I have used this week? I think we should all do this so that we can reduce it, right? Because it should start from us even before we can influence others. Thank you so much, Yubel, for that. Now we will proceed to the discussion. Uh, I would like to invite our friends who are participants in this uh, conference to please write in the chat area if you have any question for our particip for our speakers but let me start the ball rolling <laughs> because i'm interested to know um this question i would like to ask to miss stacia clinton and also if possible uh to yobel so what are the concrete recommendations for hospitals or other industries to reform their food systems post-COVID, right? Because there has to be something that we can do, that we should do, in a way that builds resilience as well as reduces carbon footprint. Do you have any recommendations? Yes, thank you for the question. And I think um, my fellow speakers and I spoke a, a bit about some of these opportunities, but to summarize a bit here, uh, there's first the opportunity to look at your purchases and um, both from a composition perspective, the opportunity to purchase items that have a lower greenhouse gas impact, so moving towards more plant-based diets, as well as looking to source um, from an array of suppliers that are both local and sustainable 
producers of food. Um, this allows us to not only mitigate um, and any contribution to climate change through food service, but also to support building economic resilience and health of those local farm and food businesses. I also mentioned just the opportunity to build strong relationships with uh, community partners and organizations um, that create a network of support for hospitals during times of disaster. So in the example that I provided, um, the hospital had built relationships with a for-profit business that had strong relationships with a, a large network of food donation centers. That made it easy for the hospital to leverage the production of food inside its hospital to then transmit it out into the community more broadly when they had increased need. Um, so that's another example where it not only reduced the hospital's climate footprint by reducing food waste, but also addressed a need in the community around food insecurity by creating this network of support. Um, and then I, I think our last speaker um, was a, a critical one to raise the importance of how do we plan for these disasters so that we're not purchasing more toxic products as a result. Um, plastics, single-use plastics have, ex have increased significantly in the face of COVID-19. And so hospitals really need to align with other organizations serving the public to understand what opportunities there are um, to continue to provide food in a way that doesn't increase use of plastics or other contaminating um, materials. So those would be my top three recommendations. Thank you so much. Uh, you, Yabel, would you like to add to that? Yes, so for hospital, I think um, the concept is to go reusable. So first in food services, look for services that offer reusable containers. I believe there's a local products or local you know, um, culture like using bamboos or also other natural resources that can purchase locally that empower local economy to you know, get a point of those single-use plastic. So that's one big thing. And second, uh, as I mentioned, for composting and coupling it with a local delivery system for food, it will really empower the whole, not only the hospital, but the community within that city. So it's a good thing to know uh, if we can manage um, our food waste by composting and make like urban um, gardening like what we've seen in uh, our presenter, previous presenters presentation, it will be significantly helpful, especially in the long term. And for other like um, maybe practices like use, using, um, choosing usable PPEs uh, over disposable ones, there is a lot of alternatives and it doesn't require burning. So that's a good news. I believe healthcare without harm has a lot of reference on that. And the other thing is, um, invest in better cleaning equipment and protocols. One of the reasons why food waste is huge in number is because first, we don't really count the supply and the demand. So that will get a lot of you know, food loss in the process, especially in big cities. So if we can calculate it um, rightfully and then connect it with local supplier, it will help. And second is to make sure we have good housekeeping system. So that can be improved in your uh, standard operational protocols that ensures uh, how to handle the food so it can have a long life shelf, yet it's still healthy, fresh, and organic. Um, I like on the virus that stays longer in plastic surfaces. So from all um, the researches, in general, we can see a pattern, and the pattern shows that plastic lasts longer. So there's a risk. And so this is not um, similar with what the industry say that plastic is use for better safety for our uh, you know, health during the pandemic. No, it's actually uh, the other side. And reusing plastic, uh, reusable products is what can make us safer, yet it's good for the environment and good for your health and your future generation. So I think that's uh, the highlight point. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Those are wonderful recommendations. Um, another question I have here. Uh, to for Dr. Tintin Fari Hatini, and if possible also from Ms. Claire Westwood, what policy should be in place to ensure the food security and nutrition of healthcare facilities during pandemics and disasters? 
Yes. Um, thank you. For the policy, actually, I think the, the, the Ministry of Health, this is for the health, uh, health facilities. The Ministry of Health uh, also provide the guidance. But in sharing our practice, uh, for example, that we um, make, I mean, the, our director uh, make like a circular letter that uh, we provide our own food. Like sometimes we have our own food from uh, our residents from home. And then the others is the regarding the, uh, what is it, the use of um, other resources that is available in our hospital. But this is also, we have to take into account the security. Uh, I mean, the, in terms of the other pollutants, we need to, to avoid the source of uh, the food inside our health facilities. But uh, the good thing is like to make our land, um, it's probably for us because we are in, um, Suburban area, we have plenty of areas for planting, but probably for health facilities in urban area where they have only white and only short place to grow any plants. That's, that's the rooftop gardens or the vertical gardens. That's a good idea for that. And uh, regarding the plastics, to be honest, yes, we still uh, use some. But we have been thinking to use the plastic, the biodegradable. So now it has been available some plastics from cassava skin or the shrimp waste. So using the plastic, say for the packaging, is uh, will not harm our planet. I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Ms. Claire. Yeah, thanks so much, Ms. Lady, for that question. I think um, hospitals can begin with their own internal policies to, to do what some of the, like, uh, Searchy and Adventists have been doing. Uh, they could serve more vegetarian food. Um, they could think about the utensils in which the, 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 the food comes in, the water comes in, maybe not simple things like stopping the use of mineral bottle water and so on and so forth. Sometimes you see these plastic spoons and so on, they can go make a policy to change from to reusables. Um, and they could also uh, make a policy to sort of procure food from local communities around. In Asia, I mean, there are a lot of small farms that are not very far, may not be very far from the hospital. So it's possible to actually, and that will also regenerate local economies and um, in, uh, produce, but they could insist that they be ecologically grown and they do not use, for instance, pesticides and so on. They could do that. Uh, at ministerial level, they could think about food waste. I mean, if they could invest in um, compost, maybe machines and so on, uh, that would help because uh, like uh, Kutek Port Hospital, they have this big compost machine and I think they fill it in uh, once a week or something and then they, that compost is used. It's also sold. Um, but I think cutting down on food waste and, and sort of making a policy that a hospital should really control its its food waste and also the um, the 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 food should be local food. I think that policy can be done easily in different countries a lot. There's no need, for instance, to serve um, apples. All right, I, it's in Asia. I mean, there's so much more healthier food, which is vitamin A rich and so on, with lots of beta carotene and all that papaya and 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 um, cassava and so on. So going back to some of the traditional food. And exciting people that traditional food can be nutritious, uh, easily available, and healthy. Thank you. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Okay, last question. Uh, this is for Dr. Mingnan Lin and Ms. Eden. Um, how can hospitals advance the health of communities within and outside the hospitals? Uh, who would like to go first? Ms. Eden? Okay, um, thank you for the question. Well, we can advance the health of the community within by continued education. And for the outside, well, we need to have a partnership with our, um, with our local governments and um, communities. So that's, I guess, one of the simplest thing that we can do to advance the education part of, the, of our community. And 
our government. Our and outside. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Mingnan Lin? Okay, I think uh, Dr. Mingnan Lin um, is, uh, is occupied with uh, something right now. So at this point in time, I will be opening the forum with the audience. It's your chance to ask our speakers. I've been checking our inbox, trying to see if there are any questions. Don't be shy. Uh, we have experts with us. So if you are, if you would like to inspire even more or any uh, idea that you are rolling out in your own institution that you would like to, you know, ask ask about please share in our chat area now i think there is no question because the presentations are really very clear so with that let's proceed to the next part of our program today with of course miss gladys wong Ms. Gladys is currently serving as the Senior Principal Dietitian at the uh, Kutekpot Hospital. I love this hospital in Singapore. She is a New Zealand registered nurse, a dietitian and accredited dietitian of Singapore Nutrition and Dietetics Association. Her current focus is on dietetic placement education, community and geriatric dietetics, institutional food services, health promoting and environmental sustainable type of initiatives. Her latest collaborative projects include developing a commercially viable and sustainable food production model using 3D food printing and product development of high protein textured modified foods in the food for elder skin. Wow, I'm excited. Now let's listen. To Miss Gladys Wong. Right, everybody. Okay, let me just share the slide. Okay, can you hear me, everybody? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, on behalf of City for Hospital. Thank you for uh, inviting me to come and share with everybody. Um, my my stand is supposed to so I'm not just share about the hospital but sort of lay forward on what are the effects that happen in the sustainable food systems and how with this COVID nineteen and what may happen in the future. That is what we call the new normal, isn't it? No? So the way forward. Okay, I'll join the screen. Hang on a minute. I just need to actually reshare the thing again. I think I said the wrong. I got to reshare the screen again. Don't worry, Miss Gladys. We are very much excited with your interesting topic. I could already see that uh, the presentation is so colorful, and we will wait for that. At this point in time, while we are preparing that, I will be checking again the chat area for any questions. Don't be shy. If you want to ask our speakers for any question, feel free to comment in our inbox 
And um, as long as we have time, we will be asking them. All right. Now we have it. Okay, back to you, Miss Gladys. Yes, all right. Sorry about that. Just now, so talking about way forward, let's, let's put it into perspective first, okay? So what is what's the meaning of sustainable uh, food system? So whether this is simply uh, FAO, it's a food system that delivers the food security and nutrition for all and such a way that economic, social, and environmental needs to be generated for the first and for future generations. And it's not that we look at economic sustainability, the social sustainability, as well as the environmental sustainability. So, what's the sustainability part of the FAO? We have this 17 uh, sustainable development goals here. So, you look at it that we look at food. Where has the food system? Let's remind everybody that food is everywhere. Right? So, it is affecting all these. Uh, I can, I mean, I can. I'm sure you can all tell a story about food, maybe before the food is really popular, the food is there. So let's bring it back to the closest to what we have in the food that we have in the food that we have in the food and see the kind of agendas that we have. So the agenda that we have is looking at food branding. So where does food and food branding come from? It's because we were the first country in Singapore to the HPH, South American Council in Singapore in the food, and we joined GP to change it. So looking at the food agenda, food is one of the ten. But when we look at the food, the food is number seven. But when we look at it this way, we are saying that food is the ingredient that binds us together. Let's see that. I mean, let's let's remember, you know, even with COVID or no COVID, we still need to eat to enjoy for fellowship. So really, this is the diagram that I shared before a few times. That food is really the center of all the agendas. And, and being a dietitian, of course, there is that special interest that you really can surround everything else. So, especially in the hospital setting, okay, especially in the hospital setting. So, when we look at it this way, then, where do we put things? I think Dr. Mingan earlier has shared with you that we have a business license, okay, and we started that probably about three, four years ago. And we got some data, data to my colleague, uh, Shelly, she was looking for some things we did. See, we did increase to 59 percent of the sale of meatless dishes in the year 2009 to 2007. So there is just a little bit of food improvement to say, you know, to say that we could try our best in terms of meatless market. And also, and what, what, you know, it's not, it's not every patient, uh, vegetarian hospital, per se, as a hospital, but, but what we want to do is just a one day a week. We know we have our choice, our responsibility to ensure sustainable nutrition, safe health. So we, we want people to recommend. Miss Gladys? Yes. Sorry, I would just like to request you to kindly increase your volume because uh, we are very excited with your presentation and we would like to hear okay. it even more. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is it better? Is it better? Okay, right. Very loud. <laughs> but never mind. Okay, so sorry about that. So we're looking at it this way for the next thing. So sustainability is not just about the actual consumption of low carbon food, like you know, avoiding meat, but it is the food system that the various systems also involve to watch food consumption. I think it's, it's all matter to be because we talk to me and uh, talk to Malcolm to get that in it. Remember, it's not just about the food that you eat, it's not just being vegetarian, it's about not, not the production of the food, but it's really looking at what are the other things that go with. So, at our hospital, yes, we do really try to say no to meat. So, we have not had to make it well since September. It did take a little while because we need to help and teach people and staff to say, is that okay? Ah, bubble tea in Singapore. So, bubble tea in Singapore requires it. More. So we had this process to go small free and we engaged the uh, tenants to no. help us to go into the as well. Okay, so no single straws, plastic straws since uh, September 2018. This is a but in the ward with the patients, we still have straws because they do need the straws to have their nutrition customers 
I'm hoping to live. But you know, it's not all spectacle, and they've not come to the same thing. So we also went to the extent of uh, making sure that all these people who don't make it close at the pharmacy, they were so shocked to sit down. And, and we also have this culture of being loose and being our own. So we bring our own containers, bring our own store. And this is just an example to show that although we are a hospital, there is uh, quite a lot of people, but there was only 3,000 level stores that were shown. And it, 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 we turn that thing around, it's the thing that people are just thinking about. It's good. Good. And we also partner with the F and Tenant to change the cup. So when they change the cup with the flip part of the cup lid, to aid the direct feeding for us with the, from the cup without the sugar. This one we are quite proud of because my colleague actually did this with the uh vending machine person with the brand of this is a piece that has been in Singapore and all over the world. We make it all between this two dollars to three dollars. Right, and what happened yet? We all have to have a straw each. We have to have a straw and we actually put it in our contract to say that no straw. So the straw dispenser is free up. Okay, and we have to develop and modify the cups too so that we can seal it off easily for direct drinking without the need of straw. Yes, of course, we are saying that it's a plastic lid as well, but it's a compromise because we couldn't really have the paper kind of seal it. Okay. So uh, it's still a plastic lid, but at least there is no straw. And the simple yet effective way to go for the work. So we also have other things that's going on continuously uh, support with uh, looking at convenience now when we use reusable bags. I was doing some study uh, research earlier on and there were this possible ideas about using reusable bags like during COVID time where people start whipping out their reusable bags in the supermarket and that could have some convenience. But it seems that there is more approach for sustainability to use the reusable bag versus not to use any air bag. So our long beach loss also distribute reusable woven and beach bags instead of the conventional plastic ones in the inside. Of course when we do it they can use the plastic service that's used for very material process and use the reusable metal screen We also have a cutlery uh, that is put behind the stall so that people do not Voluntarily and mindlessly go and put themselves in the plastic and even be cut in state of use of them. That was all for COVID. So when the COVID turns up, we didn't have any questions for our life. Yes, I think that was just a support I got from somewhere to say that you know, we had flight cancellation, travel ban, restaurants closed, all indoor activities, but we had emergency state or emergency services flowing of supply chain, stock market. Falling, slowing panic amongst population and uncertainty about the future. But what it is in terms of food, everybody loves food, everything surrounds food. You just say, love your food, just taste less and taste more. So when we look at COVID, what is the new normal here? Okay, so I've only picked out a few things because there's a lot, but I only got 12 minutes to talk. So the new normal dying out. So if once a once a thing goes through, okay, the COVID, as it goes back to Normal. It's probably unlikely that any more bookings will be necessary. Which is one way for us. It's always been a very good thing because we ask people to do their own container and we ask people to stop looking through the internet. So, this is a lot of blessing in disguise that we have portion control. So, weight management is also a good thing to do. And what about the waste in terms of restaurants where we have to start having to do all the cleaning? Then we have more waste. We have increased use of the mask and gloves and disinfectant. So is that another way that we can decide? Which I think at the moment we can't. So if there are solutions, maybe later on that will help us decide. Probably not at the moment because we are sort of in the war zone compared to us. That needs to be more. So that there's no more individual cutlery that open condiments on the dining table for friends in the common station for cutting. If they actually go to McDonald's or KFC, we we'll probably are likely to see this happen. Or we say it will probably be different. And if we have this, what's the next thing that comes to our mind? Increase packaging and weight. So if this increase has given increasing packaging and weight, what are we going to do there? Is that a new package? So how do we manage it instead? So plastic packaging in terms of grocery stores as well, is it a billion or a few 
from because now with the plastic uh, ATP they are coming back in to say that let's remove all these plastic pollutants. It's, it's a war zone now. It's a full correct. I you look at it. Two years ago, the world food quantity is actually there's a more cutback in the rice because of the COVID. But as many as you look, is it safe to have it or not? CDC currently says that there is no evidence to suggest that any food or consuming food And it's also very, very noted that from all this food and packaging and taking drinking water, that we want to get COVID. I don't know, this is a very soft one. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. okay, is this good? Is this better? Okay, we'll try it again. Huh? Sorry about this, so there is no risk of getting COVID 19 from food. Packaging or even detect drinking water. So, so what about in the ward? In the ward, when we have patients in the ward, here, okay, we talk about feeding the patients. In our hospital, we have an in house kitchen. We have to feed the patients separately using the disposable. So, we will have to use disposable. And also, with the staff, we have to arrange an external caterers. To feed them because they cannot leave the ward to stay by their own food, they have to bring the food to them. So we have to use quite a lot of disposable plastic packaging, which looks like this with the two compartments. Um, the Taiwanese, they have this paper version, this is the one we have over here, but we can't really use it because our food is got rice and two different meats together and vegetables. So, so the, the people in Singapore don't like to eat the food until they are. So this is just an interesting uh, exercise that I showed. Yeah? I went to weigh the food. I went to weigh the, the, the container. So each container with the lid is 55 grams. The cutlery set is 17 grams. Every day we have to feed 150 patients and 500 meals. Start meals. So that's it. That's less than two months together. In total, that's 650 meals. So when you add that up together in total, <clears throat> we are still COVID days. We have increased 46 to 8 kg of blood sickness every day. Every day, we have had these 50 kilos of blood sickness. That if COVID has not been around, we could have been actually improving all this. Yeah, just imagine how many months of COVID we have been. And we're not even talking about corn wear, whether it actually helps or not. But some saving grace, we try to do little baby steps. Okay? We see it much our work. Staff to do their own cutlery. So instead of using this disposable cutlery, we have to sell some of them bring their own metal one or this pipe or even the spot. This is the spot where the screen and the pot and the screen together. So this is the cutlery now. Let's look at another angle in terms of COVID. What's the way forward? The way forward likely we are going to have a lot of vending machines. Okay? There will be a lot of vending machines coming in the whole world. Why? Because the vending machine that the dietitian has one third of the kind of sheets and lollies that people put in the vending machine are likely going to be the one to be used for 24 7 because it's a very clean and a safe transaction. It is uh, also a contactless nourishment that we have to work with the vending machine uh, suppliers to provide healthy food for people for 24 7. Because this is in the UK, where they showed that the farmers' food has seen that their hospital care has doubled in much, whereas in other places, the business has closed. But when we have this, it is cheap. We do start to be food because people only buy when they need it. But it also means that there is increased packaging. There will be a lot of increasing packaging this because it is in the individual stock. So there will be a lot. So when we look at this now, what's a new normal that's working from home? Everybody working from home now is going to be a bad driver. There will be also increasing weight because everybody will be buying more than food. Buying not just food itself, they will also be buying things like shopping, to be buying a lot of uh, unnecessary things. So they will be overspending, then they will have increasing weight. So when you look at all this now, it's not just about eating the food. Going to this Monday. It is all of the things that surround it as a food system. All the 
we were talking about, we have a lot of spending power. So let's go back to basics and we have to turn the whole thing around and be very humble. Thank God for nature, thank God for life, thank God that we are still alive, you know, that kind of thing. And we are talking about plus our own and keep our own. Singapore has a this new Singapore food agency. When we're looking at food pictures and the whole world, there is a lot of funding in the food that we get. So we had this goal by 30, uh, by 2030, that Singapore will be self sufficient for 30% of our food. At the moment, it's only 10%. Now it's only 10%. By 2030, we want to be 20% self-sufficient. So there was a lot of encouragement to grow your own vegetables, do pot gardening on, on those uh, empty schools, and a lot of open spaces. Thank you for that. Even better schools, what has done recently, right, they have actually given out in June, every household that applies for it has two packets of seeds. Two packets of seeds to grow their own green vegetables. We have also put this online, so you can actually go to this website and say gardening with the edible, so they can even teach you how to grow the seeds of that. Just to get people um, interested in that. Okay? So we also have this, this is only recently last Saturday, where they have these people doing all these webinars free of charge, gardening at home. You know, there's just a lot of things just now into gardening, planting your own, and cooking your own food. So definitely, uh, earlier on, uh, cash and uh, economy and shared as well. So, but how Singapore's known as for this farming, we have an edible garden. Yes, we do have that, and there's a lot of passionate volunteer gardeners are stuck at home at the moment because they can't come to the hospital. So, our own gardeners have to do a lot of things as well. And also, as a dietitian, we do not have any more live cooking demonstrations because of the social space situation. So, my colleagues here have, uh, come up with all this, the cooking videos and nutritional outlets. So we'll be doing a lot of exploiting, um, exploiting technology in order to help to reach out to people. In that way, we also are talking about the cooking uh, vegetarian food to share with people how to cook and buy things and eat. That is the way forward, I think. There is a lot more, but I think this is all I can share in terms of how the hospital can, can be involved in that. But more. I hope I have a bit more time, eh? What about way, way forward? What about way, way forward? Uh huh. Well, um, okay, can I continue now? <laughs> okay, what about way, way forward? Way, way forward, we are talking about innovative food services of the future. When before COVID came in, there was this thing about previous institutions. Now with COVID, there is even more, more justification about this. A lot of it. Actual palatable and portable food in it is safe and stable shelf life. In it, we need real food. We can keep calm and quite nutrition, uh, malnutrition. We food safe. And also, we want to exploit technology. Exploiting IGAR includes productivity, we can help go, and also, we can stop wasting food because I can drink anything. I can recycle and print anything. So in Singapore, just to share a little bit about this, we have a Singapore Center of Innocence and Economy, where we have funding for NAMIC as well, to work together on TV system. So this is just one of them, the initial stage that we have, right? And put fluid in. And this is one of the lecturers that has done this polarization on food upcycling, on jet food food, to recycle it so that it's to make it into little cookies and boil it up to cook rice. We have also done this. This is more for the soldier patients who are uh, who, who have swallowing difficulty. So a fluid diet they actually get to uh, eat it as well to enjoy the food as it is. The future of 3D food printing, the way way forward in terms of after COVID, we say that we want to play using real food. So it's usually a Modified with safe consistency, consistency to treat people with exposure that need to be swallowing and chewing difficulty. But if you move forward, it's really to say that I can print anything using whatever ingredients that the food technology can conjure in order to make it look, smell, and taste like real food. This is to me, but it's not just a real food itself, it could also mean a snack. That means I can really print anything. So 3D printing is precision printing, can print anything in the future, including any home videos that's not even in it. So it's sun-based use that can be printed too. Insects can 
also be translated into all these verses. It's already happening overseas. In Singapore, we talk to you, but do more research in Singapore. This is in fact nuggets of basketball work in Belgium. So what about three years to bring to a new alternative? Yes, definitely that would be the way to go to be looking at. Uh, at areas that there is a uh, kind of sustainability and having a uh, good security in printing food could be another way of looking at it. Because why? When you can print the food out, I can print anything in fact, I can use huge nutritious uh, meat things into food and just turn it down and drop it into those vegetable countries or places that need help or disaster countries. So, as you can see, we use glass. To print chocolate glass, we give ingredients as a core component and we distribute it to children as part of the school feeding program. I think one of the teachers that I mentioned quite about that. But this is another uh, exciting one. This is in Nazareth, but they are up printing food. What they did was just a couple of ladies, and I think it's a pretty, they are sustainable food printing. So they collect all the, all the leftovers or un or arguing looking carrots and peas and they and they stop buying it all up and reprint it and they print it in those cookies and all these lovely food food and recycle. Recycle. You can go to this website upprinting.com. You'll see quite a few videos about uh, and the history of what they're doing. So so in terms of way way forward, 3D food printing may be a solution to help with uh, saving food in terms of if you look at it, minimizing waste of food as well as minimizing any kind of packaging because you don't really recycle a lot. So, the global economy affected by COVID 19 is directly affecting production as well as demand, creating supply chain and market disruption because we're looking at what? We're looking at sustainability versus diversity as our food potential. So, now we put the choice to Singapore. We do actually talk about buying local, but we are also talking about buying widely so that we can be food secure. Thirty percent is our own. We can buy from twenty percent all over the world. Financial impact as well, of course, of our economy. So these are just examples of uh, things that's on our website. So Singapore to say choose fresh, choose local, local friendly. Just I list on what. So currently, Singapore is in a strong position on food security. We so we're saying it's top position in the world in food security for a second consecutive year, according to the report by Economic and Intelligence Unit. But if you look at this one, climate related and natural resources use factors are considered. Singapore falls in 12th place on this list, which means what we need to strive continually to ensure that our food security strategy remains robust. And how we can make sure that it is really sustainable, not just for food. So, the market plays a great deal by changing lifestyle and rising demand on the go food in terms of COVID nowadays because there will be no more buffet style food and I just want to collect a package and I'll go away and I'll take somewhere. Right? There will be stringent government regulations, not just a sense of sale of the food tax, looking at how the packaging cannot be safely. Social distancing and dining in place, and there's also increasing demand for healthy and healthy. There will be a lot more because I think the suspect people will be eating less because there's less food available, which means that the food has to be made easier. Summary Food is an ingredient that binds us together. I love food, that's why I'm a dietitian, because as food surrounds everything that goes with it, especially in a hospital setting. So, what can we do then? So, I suppose we can act on that. That means we need to prioritize. I think in COVID spaces, there are certain suspects we cannot do without. So, we need to prioritize what are the ways to do that. And also, more importantly, how to manage your food and disposable waste. If it has separated correctly, then it can be responsibly put in the right channel to be recycled. Trust me, of course, it's we need to review the supply chain. We need to look at all the good purchasing offices to make sure that we do we do get really plastic sort of packaging, or we should actually get other kinds of uh, alternative packaging and to see how much we can do to reduce that. And we also want to continue to nudge our staff in terms of business money and to really do our own content. 
painter and bring your cutter so that you can minimize the waste of body painting. So at Kotoko Hotel at Yen Hotel, we have this uh, four DNA areas. Two stars, big group, X, uh, start small and the X. So we do quite fast in this for hopefully uh, together as a team, we do have a new green committee. The last thing that was done was the Donald Wise is the chair of the Green Committee. So this is the Green Committee and we have seven uh, chiefs that will look at this piece of water that is green conditions such as recycling food, food and general waste, plant-based diet, as well as awareness nights and campaign sites. I hope I'll share with you what it is about going forward and hopefully that will just give you a, uh, a wider perspective. It's not just what we do to get on our plate, but what Thank you so much, Ms. Gladys. Um, don't worry, everyone. The presentations, I believe, will be shared with us. And I couldn't agree more. Food is really that one thing that binds us together. That's why it's so important that we learn how to make our planet sustainable so that even the next generations will be able to enjoy clean and nutritious food. Thank you. Ms. Stacia Clinton, Mr. Yubel Putra, Dr. Tintin Farihatini, Ms. Claire Westwood, Dr. Mingnan Lin, uh, Ms. Eden Elisan, and of course, Ms. Gladys Wong for all the knowledge that you have shared with all of us. Um, I don't really like this to stop. I love learning about the things that you have been sharing, but uh, time is uh, of the essence. We know that we have other things that are waiting for us and also we can't wait to try to apply what we have learned today with that thank you for having me as your moderator i'm now giving back the time to our host krisha thank you miss lady that was indeed a very um, fruitful and mouth-watering discussion so i hope you were inspired to practice sustainable food production and consumption I wonder how many of us will now shift to plant-based diet. Thank you again to all our speakers, um, panelists, um, and um, all of you who participated with us today. So thank you for your eagerness to learn. Contact us if you need support in initiating your sustainability actions. So just in the final announcement, in line with our today's theme, we will also conduct a solidarity and cooking event which will be broadcasted in our Facebook page this coming Friday afternoon. So this virtual event will feature videos of the best practices from our member hospitals, solidarity messages, and calls for action. And we will also show a plant-based cooking session to amplify the benefits of a low-carbon footprint diet. So follow our Healthcare Without Harm Southeast Asia Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for more information on this event. So we hope to see you again for our next roundtable discussion. Bye for now and keep safe, everyone.